that is bright. All right, hi everyone. Thank you so much for joining. I am here to talk to you today about five key mistakes that founders make when building go-to-market. But first up, who am I? I have spent the last 14 years of my career building sales orgs at hypergrowth unicorns. First at Eventbrite, and then six and a half years at Slack, where I started as the first sales hire out of headquarters, then at Webflow, where I was director of sales, and now at OpenAI, where I'm helping to lead our go-to-market teams. Outside of that, I'm also a very active uh, venture capitalist. I started a fund with seven other women, uh, seven of the most notable women who have built incredible go-to-market organizations such as Vanta, Twilio, Twitter, Airtable, Dropbox, Box, Segment 5, Tran, Notion, the list goes on. And together we have 150 years of collective go-to-market experience. But our favorite thing to do is to advise our founders. We've made 23 investments and we love to coach our founders to help them see around corners and not make the mistakes that we have made when scaling go-to-market. Outside of that, as you can see, I am a mom to two little girls, Logan and Quinn, and six months ago, I actually became a cancer survivor. While this was not in the 2024 plan, sometimes life throws you unexpected challenges, not unlike building a startup. And because of that, we all come out and I came out stronger from it. Thank you. Thanks, all. Uh, so really, what I think one of my superpowers is, is that I can see around corners of hypergrowth. And that's what I'm doing today, is I'm taking five of the most common mistakes that founders make and distilling them for you all into a very tactical playbook. You don't need to take notes because this is recorded and it will be on YouTube afterwards at some point. So I really want you to listen and to think critically about what are these mistakes? How have I seen them? How might I see them? And how can I take the things that Maggie told me and implement them in the future? So for every one of these sections, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start with a relevant story, something that I lived through, and then we're gonna go through that story and we're gonna go into the tactical areas of what you can do to avoid what happened to me and to my companies, so that way the same hopefully won't happen to you. So let's start off with story number one and the topic of building a culture of accountability. So it was March 2015, uh, March 19th to be exact, I'll never forget the day, and I walked into Slack. I was first sales hire, it was my first day. Slack was about 50 people at this point in time, um, and, I, and I was starry-eyed. I was just ready to get going. They had just raised a lot of money. I walk in, and it is the weirdest environment I've ever experienced. It is quiet, it is somber, and it quite frankly just feels awful. And right away, my new boss pulls me off into a room and says, I need to talk to you. Something bad happened. He sits me down and he let me know that Slack got hacked. This is not what you want to hear on your first day at a new job. Shortly after that, I'll never forget when Stuart Butterfield, our CEO, stood up on a desk and he essentially said, this is going to be terrible. It is going to take a long time to get through this, but we will do it as a company. We will make it through this together. And ultimately, we did. I actually bet most of you probably don't remember this hack today that we were worried was actually going to take down the company. And ultimately, we recovered from this hack. And what pulled us through was that we had built a culture of accountability. We cared deeply about our product, about our customers, about each other, and we were so motivated for and by Stuart. And this is why you, as a founder, this is your responsibility, is to build a DNA of accountability. And the very first thing that you need to do is you need to make sure everyone in your company understands how their role ladders up to the greater mission. How does every single SDR contribute? How does every single marketer, all the way up to the VP of marketing and the CMO, what role do they play and how does it contribute? And then you need to take all of these milestones and you need to celebrate them. Things that might feel small to you are going to feel really big to others. Something that we actually do at OpenAI, which is really fun, is we have this concept of tacos. So essentially, every single day, you can give your allotment of tacos, their emoji 
Fuji tacos to people who did great things. And then we have a taco store, you can redeem it. But it builds this really fun excitement when someone does something great and you're able to give them this recognition of, hey, I recognize you. The other thing, this is maybe not intuitive, but I believe you need to put the entire company on an incentive plan. Normally, just go to market is on incentive plans, and I think you should put the whole company on an incentive plan. We actually did this at Slack. We tied the entire company to our ARR goals, so every single person had a piece of the pie if we hit those targets. Incentive plans don't have to be cash. It could be equity, it could be a company trip, it could be something else, but people are financially motivated and it is really important to help recognize that. The other thing that you can do to help build a DNA of accountability is to focus on what we called, at least at Slack, business time. And what this means is in every single all hands or every single week in a weekly recap, to be talking about revenue. Revenue is not a dirty word. You should be educating your engineers, your product teams, your marketers, your support team. Everybody should know how the company is performing. Get them used to concepts like ARR, GRR, and NRR and help bring everyone along on this journey with you. And I have found that it actually tends to be engineers and product who care more about business time than go to market because go to market is already so close to it. You should also think about setting up a customer wins and a customer losses channel. I have done this at Slack, Webflow, and OpenAI, and it is so important when every single time your company closes a deal or has a big expansion or has a major customer milestone for the whole company to realize this. And conversely, in the customer losses channel, you should be having the go-to-market team sharing what are the reasons that you're losing deals, what are the competitors doing. And I have found in our customer losses channel, at least at OpenAI, our engineers are actually the most active in there. If they hear that we had a deal go to someone else, they jump right in and they say, how could we have saved this? And then finally, it's really important to move, remove mishires quickly. If any of you are here from Zoe's talk from Sequoia, uh, about an hour ago, she talked a lot about the damage that mishires can have to a culture. A mishire can actually cost a company one and a half to two X the amount of their salary. However, they can create much longer lasting damage when they are having a really bad cultural impact as well as they're having bad impacts on your customers. So let's talk about the next section, which is targeting the right market segments. And this is one of the most crucial things that you can do early days so you don't waste your time or your reputation on customers who are a bad fit. All right, so it was 2016, and Slack at this point was maybe 150, 200 people, and our largest customer to date, I think, was about 500 people, and that was really the upper bounds of where we wanted to go. Well, Uber came to us, and Uber was like, we want to try out Slack. And we knew at this point in time, Uber had a couple thousand people, and it would be our biggest customer yet. We didn't think our infrastructure could handle it, but outside of our best judgment, we let Uber on board anyways. Not only did our Slack instance of Uber tank, but it took down the entire website. But what was worse about having Uber churn to arrival was the damage that it did to our reputation. And we had to spend the next four years telling enterprises our stability story, our security story, and getting them to believe that we were indeed enterprise readiness. So the learning here is to rarely start with the enterprise. And I know enterprises are sexy. I know the Walmarts, the Oracles, the T-Mobiles of the world, these are the logos that you think you want. And presumably, these logos will have a big contract, right? That, that would make sense. But there's many reasons that you should not work with the enterprise until you are ready. And the first one is that they have complex hierarchies and long decision-making processes. Most enterprises are going to be a nine to 12 month plus sales cycle. Well, you'll have to work with multiple people, you'll have to do RFPs, you'll have to work with procurement, and it's going to slow you down and drag you down. They are also going to have scalability and support concerns. So in the same thing that happened with us in Uber, 
enterprises are going to expect things like 99.999% uptime, and they're going to expect that you respond to them within two to three minutes with an SLA. And as a startup, these are things that you just probably can't do very well. They are also going to delay revenue. Enterprises expect things like net 60, net 90, biannual payments. And as a startup, revenue is your lifeline. You cannot wait half a year to be paid. They're also going to expect really deep customization, something that they will ask you to do that you will say, sure, no problem, and it will inevitably become a distraction and completely make your roadmap go in a different direction. And then finally, they are rarely innovative and they're rarely risk takers. Let's pretend you're an infrastructure company and you're 15 people. There's a very small chance that a large scale enterprise is going to trust you with their business. So let's talk about what you should do instead. The first thing that you need to do is you need to define your ICP or your ideal customer profile. But really the best way to do this is to look at your current customers today and look at what are the similarities between them. Where are they getting the most value from your product? And then which ones are you solving the most acute pain for? And it is as simple as you want to start to create a list of who are these customers, and then you want to find folks that look and feel like them. So once you have your ICP, quite literally go create a spreadsheet and start to map out the companies that you should be going after. And I recommend not doing more than 100. There's thousands of companies out there. Keep it narrow and focused and take a crawl, walk, run approach. You can revisit your ICP every three to six months or really as often as you want. And honestly, I found a great tip to do this is quite literally just go to ChatGPT or whoever your preferred AI partner is and ask them for similar companies that are similar to the list that you're feeding into it. It really shouldn't take you more than a few hours. Hours. To end with a happy note, we actually got Uber back four years later. And while it took time, an important call out of this is that we won them when the time was right for us and for our product capabilities. So let's talk about the third section here of understanding the right buyers. The importance of identifying your economic buyers early on in the sales process is crucial. Unqualified buyers can and eat up, can and will eat up your most expensive resource, which is your time. I'm going to tell you a pretty painful story that happened September 30th, which is the end of our quarter, a couple months ago at OpenAI. We had a large end of quarter deal. We were working with the CIO of a very notable company. It would have been a hallmark landing for us to get. And the CIO asked us to jump through all of the hoops possible. We put together creative pricing structures. We did a really well thought out uh, pilot. We did a lot of things that were not things we would typically do, but we did it because the CIO told us it would be an end of quarter deal. Well, I want you to take a look at this email. And if you have ever done founder-led sales, an email like this is probably going to bring a very familiar pit to your stomach. And for that, I am sorry. On the very last day of the quarter, we got this note that essentially says we will not be able to proceed forward today. The executive of the business has decided to delay the final approval, and there's been some challenges to the plan. <clears throat> Our challenge here is that we had not uncovered who else needed to sign off. We assumed, because there was a C in the title, or even a VP in the title, that this person was authorized to buy, but they indeed weren't. So let's talk about how you can first off understand and suss this out earlier on so you don't make the same mistake, and then let's talk about some of the questions that you should be asking early on in the sales cycle. So first off, it's so important to understand early on who can make the purchase. I really don't want you all to get starry-eyed because it's a shiny logo that you think you can close. 
So here's some of the signs that you can start to uncover early on. If you're asking the person about budget and what, how purchases have been done in the past and they can't give you a straightforward answer, that is a red flag. Let's say they can't avoid, or they're avoiding timelines. I personally like to do a walk back with the customer from implementation date, not from deal closure date, but implementation date. And if they can't work through a time frame with you and give you different milestones that need to be hit, you're also probably not working with a decision Maker. And finally, they're unclear on approval process. And the outcomes to this are probably pretty obvious, but they're going to lead to stalled deals or just dead deals. It's going to be prolonged sales cycles. And again, it's going to be a resource drain. You've all probably spent time before on deals that didn't go anywhere. So let's talk about what you can do here. You should always be asking the buying questions up front, but you don't want to ask someone, are you the decision maker? That's a really tacky thing to ask someone, and it's also going to undermine their authority if they think they have authority, but they really don't, which unfortunately in our case with that CIO is exactly what happened. So here's a very elegant way that I like to ask if somebody is the buyer or what control they have. I'll read it out to you. In this recent economy, we've been seeing all kinds of new buying committees popping up. We often hear the CFO is the new CEO. Can I ask who else might need to be involved in approving this before it's signed? For example, your CFO Tom or your CEO Mary? And you can see this is a really elegant way of still getting to that same answer of who's the signer and who's the decision maker, but you're not directly asking them that. And then you always want to layer on, in which case this is what we missed, of beyond these people, is there anyone else who could slow down or reject this deal? All right, let's talk about our next section, which is market awareness and distribution. I'm going to speed it up just a little bit in, uh, in the effort of time here. So this was 2018, we were back at Slack and we were getting ready for an IPO. We thought that we had won the market and we were thrilled about it. We have the best product out there. Well, what happened is we were wrong. And sorry, just to go back to that last one, we took out a full page ad in the New York Times welcoming Microsoft to the game, thinking there was absolutely no way they would beat us. We completely underestimated the power of distribution that big, large incumbents could have. At the end of the day, I would still say Slack is one of the most successful companies of our generation. And just because we didn't have distribution, we were an execution machine. We had an IPO and a $27 billion acquisition. And the reason for our success is we nailed marketing, PLG, go-to-market, customer success, customer love. We knew how to execute. And so my takeaway for you with all of this is that distribution, while it's important, it's not everything. And you can go up against the incumbents that might have great distribution, and respectfully, a subpar product, but you still can beat them, but it's going to take hustle and grit. So let's talk very quickly about three companies who are doing this in an exceptional and all very different way right now. First off, you've got Clay. Clay is probably one of the breakout stars of 2024, recently raising from Sequoia and valued at over $500 million. And the reason for, a big reason for Clay's success is they've built this entire community of what they call Clagencies, essentially a partner network. And these Clagencies are out there educating people about Clay and posting upwards of 500 pieces of content on LinkedIn and Twitter every single month. And Varun and Kareem, the two founders, have done an exceptional job fostering this entire partner community. You've also got Unify, who is another breakout star of 2024. And Unify is in a really crowded space right now. They are building an automated end-to-end -end outbound solution where there's many other competitors out there. But what they are doing differently than others is they have created this drumbeat of social media on their LinkedIn where the founder Austin is posting every single day about his learnings and his stories and how they are using the product to fuel their growth. 
And then finally, POCUS. POCUS created an entirely new category a few years ago of product-led sales. And the approach that Alexa has taken is she has done it via community building. She's built podcasts, she's built Slack communities, webinars, and her superpower is that she can take one 30-minute piece of content, so she'll do an interview with me for 30 minutes, and turn it into five different pieces of content. Webinars, blog posts, emails, tweets, you name it. So I'm going to talk to you about two ways that I think are incredibly crucial and my two top tips for how you can start to gain awareness and market share. And the first one that I find, candidly, most founders do really poorly is they don't put their investors and network to work. Out of the 23 investments that we've made at 20 sales, uh, I would say probably two or three of our founders are doing this really well. So what you want to do is you want to take that spreadsheet that you created, remember the one we talked about before, and you want to create a column for your investors and network to sign up for. And you should be going out to every single one of your investors and asking them to sign up for the people they can help make introductions to. I also want you to ghost write a letter that is easily forwardable. This is probably the most important part here. And here's an example of Andy, who's one of our founders at Tracebit, amazing company that raised from Excel London earlier this year, where he reached out and he said, hey, do you know someone at Webflow? Of course I do. Was able to create an email. I was able to click forward and within minutes had a response from the CEO of Webflow and he landed a great meeting. It was very low lift on me and really impactful for him. The other thing you should be doing is leveraging AI to do your heavy lifting. In a world before AI, you had to spend hours of research, of reading 10Ks, of trying to understand the who's who. You can now create a GPT, which will do all of this for you in minutes, that will do your customer research, your call prep, and will write your call and email follow-up. All right, let's talk about the fourth section. Um, and Really, this, this is one that is so important that I want to emphasize, but there is no point in acquiring new customers if you can't retain them. You won't have a successful company if you can't retain your company or your customers. So Moderna came to OpenAI with a mission. They wanted to save more lives. We decided that we were up for the task and we wanted to help them figure this out. No small feat, right? For example, one of the first things that we did is we partnered with them on creating Dose GPT. Essentially, they wanted to reduce time to dose recommendation during clinical trials. We created a GPT that pointed to clinical trial outcomes, and this GPT could analyze data and make recommendations. They then tested it against historical trials where they knew that the correct answer, they knew all the correct answers, and they found this GPT to be shockingly accurate. They believe that dose GPT will cut down time to recommendation for doses from clinical trials by 75%. Moderna no longer thinks about ROI in terms of time saved, or in ter but sorry, they no longer think about it in terms of time saved, but they think about it in terms of lives saved. And as a cancer survivor, I love this story more than any other because we believe that the work that OpenAI and Moderna are doing will indeed save more lives. And I know that my life would have been drastically shortened if it wasn't for great companies like this. And the reason that I tell you this story that is, there we go. Uh, what we did with Moderna, and the reason that I share with you all, is because this is what you should be doing with all of your customers, which is partnering deeply with them to create value. I hate losing a customer more than I love winning one, and there is nothing more important to a customer than the value that you create for them, and the best way to do this is to create everlasting customers. And this is why you should invest in customer success before you invest in sales. And I know this is counterintuitive, but the best founders lean in heavily to investing in customer success and making their customers successful. Founders should also be doing the first minimum 15 deals on their own and be doing founder-led sales, but I believe you should bring on customer success after the first five customers, which will ensure personalized support and for you to do things that are not very scalable. 
And that's because acquisition costs five times more than retention. And the benefits of retention are so much more than revenue. It's early customer feedback, it's word of mouth power, and it's references and case studies for your website. All vehicles to help you land more customers. And the impact of churn is revenue loss, reputation damage, and internal and investor morale. You probably don't want to be doing your investor updates every month talking about how much churn you have. You'd rather talk about all the new customers that you've won. And let's wrap it up with our very last section here, which is giving away your Legos, which is really about scaling and replacing or augmenting yourself, especially once your company has hit hyper growth. Let's talk about Vlad. Vlad Magdalen was the CEO and founder of Webflow. He was our CEO and he built Webflow from nothing, literally $30,000 in debt to a startup valued at over $4 billion. That is a bigger feat than probably most of us in this room will do. Vlad had had no experience running a company before this and he learned so much along the way. Vlad raised over $330 million, and he, under his leadership, he built an iconic company. But Vlad realized at some point he needed to bring someone on who had seen the movie before and who was able to take the company to the next level. And this is where Brad, Vlad brought on Linda Tong. Linda Tong is the new CEO of Webflow, and she had been the former GM of AppDynamics. And I think Vlad giving away this role or giving away his Lego is one of the most admirable things a founder could do. I can only imagine how hard this was, something he'd worked on and incubated for 12 years and to pass it off to someone who has the expertise to scale it to 30 billion and beyond. Vlad is still the chief innovation officer. He is still on the board. He is still the cultural heart and soul of the company. This brings me to my final point and the mantra that I have lived for, lived by for the last nine years, which is give away your Legos as you go through growth. And this article up here is my single favorite business article. And if you haven't read it, I, uh, I request that you read it. And if you have read it, read it again. It is something that I read every single time I am giving away part of my job or an org or a role. And it was written by this woman, Molly Gran, who's pretty iconic and has played a huge part in scaling Facebook from the early days. And really what it does is it involves understanding that holding on to your responsibilities can hinder both individual and company progress. And it requires trusting that new team members will not only take over your responsibilities, but also enhance them by letting go of what you've built or at the very least giving it away to other leaders, you will set the company and yourself up to be an even better place. And I'll leave you with this. We covered a lot today. Uh, I hope that you all took away a few pieces of knowledge that you will implement. I'd love to hear your stories, your questions. Send me a tweet, find me on LinkedIn. I will do my absolute best to respond. Uh, we've also got a QR code up here if you want to meet with the OpenAI team. There's about 15 of us here for the next two days. Uh, it was great to see you all. Great, thanks again for attending the talk and have a great rest of your slush. Thank you.